Good afternoon. On behalf of the TCU Energy Institute and the Energy MBA, welcome to the Kenneth W. Davis Jr. Leaders in Energy Speaker Series virtual event. I'm Richard Den, director of the TCU Energy Institute. First off, I would like to thank the family and friends of Ken Davis for their continued support of the series, to Charles and Michelle for their help in setting up this event, and to all of you, whether this is your first event or you have been to all of them. Today, we'll be using a webinar format. If you have a question during the talk, use the Q&A button, and we will try to get them as they come to them. This afternoon's event will be hosted by Ann Bluntzer, head of the Energy MBA program, will be introducing our speaker. And it's all yours. All right, thank you, Richard. Thank you to the TCU Energy Institute and all of the board members and stakeholders um, at the, the Institute um, and, and your support and what I think is the most important goal that we have at TCU. Um, which is to, to educate our students and our community and our, and our alumni um, and to continue that conversation um, about uh, what's important and in, in what is going on in the energy industry. And um, even more important to hopefully bring uh, people uh, onto campus via Zoom, however it may be from your home, um, to really have even a deeper understanding of maybe um, some of the, the current challenges that our industry is facing and possibly um, looking at it through a different lens and possibly thinking about the opportunities that are out there, um, especially at this time um, when there is a lot of transition, not only the, the talk of the energy transition, um, all the issues um, with, with issues and opportunities with, with ESGs and what that is presenting to all of our, all of our uh, companies and supporters in this space. Um, and then um, lastly is, you know, the, the new administration um, that looks to be to, looks to be taking um, the taking over the White House and what that will mean for us and this industry and, and hopefully ways that we can leverage that and, uh, and capitalize on some of the, the good work that that's been done um, in, in energy so far and build on it. And so um, Richard uh, with the Institute, myself, um, Dean Pullen at the Neely School of Business. Um, are thrilled uh, that today we have Ashley Sumwalt Forbes joining us um, and, and more than just her sharing her, her knowledge and experience thus far and, and her ideas moving forward, um, but has also agreed to serve on our um, advisory board um, at the Neely Business School. And we are, we are thrilled to have her energy, her enthusiasm um, and, and her intellect. She comes uh, from, a, I think, a really unique place with an undergrad at OU in petroleum engineering, um, actually working in engineering for XTO Exxon and then um, going and getting her MBA um, at Harvard Business School and is now come back to Fort Worth, um, leading the charge with Black Mountain Metals along with some other um, initiatives um, that she's gonna be sharing some of that with you today. Um, but I believe her to be a real thought leader um, she represents a different generation um, than typically who's been at the C-suite level in our energy companies. Um, and I'm thrilled and honored that she is willing to, to share her time and expertise um, with, with TCU and with our extended community. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ashley and um, I'm gonna block my screen out and you can have it from here. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Anne. That was such a kind introduction um, and I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, so I have a few slides. I'll try to not belabor any points. Um, and please use the chat function to send through questions. Um, we've reserved most of this segment for Q and A, um, and to really get to to the meat of you know what y'all want to talk about. So definitely want this to be an open and, and collaborative discussion. Um, so shoot through your questions on the chat. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Okay, so I'm a big believer in keeping things very simple and straightforward. Um, first of all, I am here to tell you that I know the term energy transition can seem very scary, um, but certainly disruption is always an opportunity for value creation. Um, you know, 
personally, my view on how energy transition and, and the future of energy looks. Um, I have two kind of core pillars for, you know, um, the, the future and specifically kind of the future of, of natural resources. And that really revolves around natural gas um, and batteries. And so I, I have some more slides that really go further into why, why, you know, we've taken this view that these are the two um, kind of most, most promising opportunities for having prevalent low cost um, and, and low carbon power for our world. Um, and we'll get into that. But, you know, first and foremost, I, I want to come out and say, like, I'm not here to tell you that I think oil and gas is completely going away. And um, counter to that, I think there are a lot of really common sense things we can do to take older energies or, you know, old, older forms of energies um, and really lower the, the carbon emission basis on those and really bridge that gap um, in, in, again, very common sense ways to a greener and brighter future. Um, so second bullet point here, over the course of human history, efficiencies have won out. And so regardless of whether or not you are a believer in the electrification of transportation in the future of electric vehicles, an EV is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. So why is that? An internal combustion engine has um, less efficiency due to heat loss, and that's not something that, that the EV experiences. And so if you just look at purely that conversion difference and, and really that trend historically of efficiencies to you know inevitably kind of win out, you realize that, okay, maybe this isn't just a hype that people are talking about. Um, maybe this truly is a bit of a shift going forward. And again, we'll dig into the value chain. We'll talk about why electric vehicles and electrification does not mean the end of the oil and gas business. It simply means some shifting around within the value chain and specifically the types of commodities that become important going forward. Um, third bullet point, electrification is accelerating. Um, so I think pre-COVID-19, you know, you were seeing headlines. Certainly there's a lot of Tesla going around, a lot of Elon Musk kind of flying the electrification flag. Um, but something that really has come out of COVID-19, um, I think governments have kind of taken away um, the, the stimulus packages that, that are being rolled out for, for um, economic recovery and aligning them with their strategic priorities. And in a lot of instances, you know, specifically if you look at places like places like Europe, places like Australia, even places like China, um, governments are, are starting to leverage those COVID-19 recovery packages to incentivize citizens to make greener choices. So um, I'm going to keep using this this. Um, this example uh, of electric vehicles, although it's not by any means not the only kind of green choice out there or, or you know, more, more renewable type um, decision that governments are incentivizing. But what you're starting to see in these governments is rolling out of EV incentives and, and really kind of an increased adoption right there. Next bullet do not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, so I get a lot of feedback when I'm talking about um, our, our battery metals mining business, Black Mountain Metals, um, and really this future of, of EVs and electrification and folks saying, you know, well, Ashley, how much are you really moving the ball down the field? Like, isn't mining a dirty business? Um, aren't you still plugging into the grid and you have carbon emissions that way? The answer is far and away, generally, yes. And so what I, what I think is becoming important now is we're starting to look at that holistic value chain and supply chain and knock out kind of each segment as we go along and ensure that each nail along the way is actually doing what it's supposed to do. Because the last thing you want is for a consumer to buy an electric vehicle thinking like, oh, hey, I am really doing um, the, the climate uh, a service and, and again, moving the ball down the field and, and 
in reality, you know, the metals weren't mined in a sustainable way. The grid is, is fired by coal-fired power stations, things like that. That's not what you want to happen. And so, you know, inevitably, we're looking at it with, with blinders on and saying this segment of the value chain, we're going to green up that segment first, and then we're going to tackle the next one. So again, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. We are moving the ball down the field, but as you all know, you can't just flip a switch and say like today we are, or yesterday we are powered by fossil fuels and today it is 100% renewables. It's just not the way it works. And um, I don't know how you would raise money to, to, to you know, roll out all of that infrastructure and flip that switch, um, nor is that in any way what I'm advocating. Um, Next one, not all natural resources are created equal. Uh, so I have actually a, um, several backup slides on this one, um, but it goes back to my point around, um, you know, mining some battery metals um, it, it is quite dirty, whereas others are mined in a responsible way. Um, it also goes to some natural gas production and processing is higher carbon emission than, than others. And I think the world we're migrating to is when you're looking at the supply chain, you know, end users are starting to care about their carbon footprints. And so I think, you know, where we're headed is OEMs and, and um, kind of end supply, suppliers are going to reach further up the value chain, form these relationships with raw material, either miners or producers, um, and, and start paying a premium for ethically sourced or low carbon uh, fuels or materials. Um, and you're really going to see a lot more certification. So a great example here is, is cobalt. Um, so I'm sure all of you have, have read articles about how there's such a challenge um, with lithium ion batteries because of the cobalt content. Um, and something like 80% of the world's cobalt is found in the DRC, um, so in, in the Congo. And um, one of the dynamics within the mining business in the Congo um, is artisanal miners. And, and oftentimes those employ child labor. And so the last thing someone who's, you know, talking on their on their iPhone or, um, uh, you know, using their computer wants to think of is the lithium ion batteries that are in those devices like children mind that cobalt. So there's a group called RCS Global that came in um, and is actually providing a certification service to ensure that the, the cobalt that's coming out of the Congo specific mines um, was mined in an ethical way, but it allows those artisanal miners to stay in the supply chain. Um, so it's, it's really a fantastic service and has really revolutionized the, the cobalt business in the Congo. And I think you'll start seeing that a lot more with different metals, um, specifically with emissions intensity of natural gas. So I, I really think there's going to be quite a large focus there as well. Last one, and then we'll actually get into the meat of this thing. But um, you know, no one is in business to lose money. And so what I'm really I think the worst case outcome for the energy transition would be um, venture funds or companies go out and deploy a ton of capital into unproven technologies. Um, and then, you know, again, you know, sometimes unproven technologies work, oftentimes they don't. Um, but what's going to happen if, you know, you fully leverage yourself to more of the unproven side, um, if you don't get returns, you're just going to circle back to square one. And so that's why I always advocate these, these smaller but sustainable and more permanent steps forward where you start leveraging lower carbon intensity fossil fuels, i.e. natural gas, um, and then leveraging batteries um, uh, to, in order to, to kind of bridge that gap. So we'll dig into more of that now. 
And look, these are just some quotes saying electrification has begun to accelerate. Um, you know, it, very much electrification um, from a battery perspective is a metals story. Um, and so, you know, raw materials really sit in the driver's seat here, as they always do. I mean, you know, everything needs to be built out of something and far and away that something is either mined or produced from the ground. And so, you know, within the electrification space, kind of nickel and copper are two of your two main ingredients. Um, and these are just some good quotes from some of the world's largest mining companies and, and, and OEMs who are starting to really think about where these metals are going to come from in the future um, and, and how, how we're going to get there. Um, so why nickel? Um, and we won't spend a ton of time here. I just want to walk through like what raw materials are going to be important and then what that differentiation is for our new net zero world. Um, nickel is basically what gives batteries energy density. So the more nickel that's in a battery, the further your car is going to go, the, the longer your, your phone's going to last, and um, you know, the, the fewer recharges you're going to have to go through. Um, and so, you know, you probably ask then, okay, why don't we just like pop a, pun, a, a ton of nickel in there and y'all can drive forever. Nickel is also highly unstable, which is why you have to couple it with cobalt in order to stabilize the lithium ion battery cathode. And so the estimated electrification impact per vehicle um, uh, of this NMC battery, NMC is nickel manganese cobalt. Um, you have about 110 pounds of nickel per vehicle and 165 pounds of copper. And um, you also have 33 pounds of cobalt. Although again, cobalt is, is declining a bit in the chemistry as we increase nickel and decrease cobalt. Um, don't know how much y'all follow nickel news, but Elon Musk, uh, probably back in, in August kind of time frame, came out and said, like, our biggest hurdle to electrifying transportation is getting more nickel into the market. So please, miners, mine more nickel. And so for me, that's really the key raw ingredient for more batteries. Um, we, we won't fully kind of walk through every chart on this, but I'm happy to address it in, in the Q and A. Um, copper, this will be a quick one. Um, all, all of y'all are probably very familiar with, um, copper wiring. And so it should come as no surprise that as more things get electrified, there will need to be more copper. And so what, why is copper the, the thing that's used for wiring? Um, so it really does come back to this, this conductivity measurement and specifically um, you know, on a cost per ounce basis. So if you look at copper, silver, and gold, these are three of the most conductive metals. Um, you know, silver is slightly more conductive than copper, um, and gold's right in there as well. If you look at it on a cost per ounce basis, far and away, you want to have copper wiring and not silver or gold wiring, which should come as, as no surprise. That being said, you know, again, just to flip back here, every EV has 110 pounds of nickel, but 165 pounds of copper. Um, so for me, you know, it really is kind of a two pronged thesis around, around batteries and it, it really revolves around both nickel and copper. Okay, okay. So again, I know I said in the beginning that I am not going to sit here and say that oil and gas totally going away, like see ya, hydrocarbon industry. And um, I genuinely believe that natural gas um, it, it is, is very much uh, the, the key to our energy transition. Um, and it, these charts are, um, are based on Australia. So apologies for that. Um, we have uh, battery metals mines in Australia, both nickel, copper, and a bit of cobalt, and then 1.7 million acres of dry natural gas uh, acreage. So if you start seeing a lot of weird uh, Western Australia references in here and wondering why, that's why. Um, so it really comes down to this chart. Um, and it's such a shame that people haven't 
um, done a great job of digging into what exactly the carbon intensity is of the various fossil fuels and, and you know, kind of where they're used in the value chain. Um, and I think this bottom left chart really says it all. Um, it's this pounds of CO2 emitted per MMBTU of energy. Um, so not only is natural gas incredibly energy dense, but it's actually incredibly clean. Um, and so if you're looking at it from a reliability standpoint, from an affordability standpoint, and from a low emission standpoint, it's actually quite hard to beat natural gas on a per MMBTU basis. Um, and so, you know, that that's very much something that it's in our personal investment philosophy. Um, we're, we're very much actioning though that philosophy with, with our acreage in Australia. Um, and it's something that we try to talk about quite a lot specifically when it comes to energy transition. Um, you know, I think fossil fuels have become such a, a dirty word, a politicized word, um, and, and you just, people haven't really done that digging on, you know, okay, okay, so, you know, maybe coal is, you know, kind of on the higher, higher CO2 emission um, areas, but, you know, there are differences in those different fuels. Okay, um, so this one's going to take some, some explaining as well. So this goes back to effectively not all resources are created equal. You know, on this slide, I talked about how much I, I like natural gas. And I'm a believer in natural gas. That does not mean that I am a believer in all natural gas. Um, I think going forward, and we're seeing this so much in where capital is being deployed, how capital is being deployed, and, and, and just the ability for, for companies to continue raising money and, and continue operating. And in fact, you know, company, um, oil and gas companies, specifically those that are trade, publicly traded, you know, it's within their, their fiduciary duty to respond to what shareholders are asking them to do. In far and away, people are very focused on this, this decarbonization theme and very much the ESG type themes, which again, happy to talk about at length in the Q&A session. Um, so I mentioned we had this, this um, 1.7 million acres in Australia. It's called Valhalla. And so these are effectively all of the undeveloped uh, gas reservoirs in Australia. For those of you who don't know, Australia is the world's largest exporter of LNG. Um, and what we have actually done is um, Valhalla is going to be the first net zero natural gas development. Um, and you're saying like, why are you doing that? Like nobody asked for that. They did. People have asked. So um, Australia's largest LNG customers are South Korea and Japan. They have both made net zero carbon pledges and are actively exploring net zero, zero fuel options. Um, in fact, there have been a few net zero LNG shipments, which commanded quite a large premium in the LNG market. Um, and it's a fantastic way to differentiate yourself and effectively bifurcate that LNG end market um, and really kind of climb that value chain such that you get paid more money than, than you would have. Um, second data point, the uh, this happened maybe last week, week before, not sure, 2020, everything is kind of blending together. But, um, you know, the French utility shelved plans to buy LNG from next decade. So that's a that's a U.S. impact um, due to pollution concerns. And so we are in a position now that the the, the requirement is on us, is on the energy company to prove that what we're doing um, it, it is, is right. So, you know, I, I, whatever right means in your book, uh, um, it, it is good, but generally it, it's whatever the customer is asking for. And so in this instance, the customers are asking for lower carbon emissions. Um, and so we're, we're answering. Um, so Valhalla, um, it's on the kind of low end of the existing Australian fields, um, but we are deploying a mixture of carbon offsets and carbon capture um, to actually decrease um, our both contained CO2 in the reservoir as well as scope one and two emissions down to zero. 
Um, so we're very much focused on this green natural gas concept as a transition fuel. So right now is the time, like you got to kind of take the bull by the horns. There's so much rhetoric around energy transition in a greener future, which I'm fully supportive of. Um, and the oil and gas business needs to position itself such that it stays relevant in the future. Um, I get a lot of feedback that, you know, it, it's worked for us historically. It'll, it'll come back in the future. D don't know. Don't know that that's the case. Um, there are some very classic examples of disruption. Um, some good ones being, I don't know, like like Blockbuster and, and Netflix. We'll we'll roll with that example. Um, and you know, Blockbuster being the incumbent had this very successful business model and just really didn't see um, people starting to to consume media content. On their, on their TVs and on their devices at home coming in any way. Um, once it started gaining, gaining steam, it was effectively unstoppable and they were knocked over. So the classic example of trying to get on the front foot and disrupt yourselves before you're disrupted needs to be employed here. Um, so can't think of, of another example in kind of modern human history where such a large industry um, was going through so much change. So the energy business, like you'd be hard pressed to find something bigger in the world. Um, and there's a ton of value creation opportunities if you're open-minded and are really responding to the opportunities at foot. Okay, off my soapbox. It's literally my favorite thing to talk about. Um, okay, so, and just quickly, um, you might you might have noticed on one of my prior slides, um, I mentioned nic why nickel sulfide. Um, if we won't get into it today. Again, that's a whole other conversation, but uh, there are two kinds of nickel. One is nickel sulfide, which is what we own in Australia, so Black Mountain Metals, and then the other is nickel laterite. Nickel laterite effectively at the elemental level and the nickel is coupled with iron. And so it's really hard to break that bond. And you have to leverage something called high pressure acid leach. Um, it, it is what it sounds like. Um, and uh, effectively, you know, from an, an energy intensity standpoint, from a pollution standpoint, and from a carbon emission standpoint, you're you're, you're effectively worse off leveraging nickel laterites than, than you are um, fossil fuels. And so you need to be really careful with these decisions that are being made and how you're navigating that supply chain. Um, and so, you know, these, um, the bottom left, those are some pretty good overviews of the, dif the differences in the flow charts. Um, so again, huge believer in nickel sulfide. And um, again, we are working on making our operations net zero. We don't have to employ high pressure acid leach. Um, and certainly, you know, I've been preaching for two and a half years since we started uh, Black Mountain Metals that, you know, there's going to be this bifurcation in the market based on um, it, this kind of, it, it, you know, being environmentally friendly. And we're starting to see that now. So OEMs do not want their name attached to nickel that it has deep sea tailings dumping or, or high pressure acid leach or is mined in, in a uh, not uh, kind of um, like in a not safe way. Um, and so they will pay a premium if it is certified that you're checking those boxes. So again, the customers are asking, all we have to do is answer those calls and rise to that standard. Not everyone is doing it. You're not going to look around and, and see, you know, we're, we're on kind of the early stages, early days of, of this wave. Um, so you're not going to look around and see everyone sticking their neck out, neck out. But it's something that we're doing that I'm really proud of. Um, and, you know, we, we are making a premium on the end product. So it, it, it makes sense. Um, Oh, this is this is actually a great slide. Um, so the importance of green sustainable supply of nickel. And again, I'm talking about nickel and natural gas. You can extend these examples to effectively any commodity. Um, supply chains are important now and consumers care. Um, but there is a really good kind of COT, 
excuse me, CO2 um, equivalent emissions um, metrics down here. If you're looking at nickel sulfide versus HPAL versus ferro-nickel NPI um, and in kind of the various countries there. So you can see nickel sulfide is way lower emission than, than employing something like HPAL or, or nickel pig iron, which nickel pig iron is what's found in Indonesia and Philippines. Um, let's see. Um, and look, it's just easier, like the fewer steps you have to go through, inevitably, you're probably going to control more of the value chain. And um, because there's there's less processing involved, less materials, less power. And um, so again, what I'm talking about in far and away what investors are asking for um, shouldn't come as a, as a huge surprise. And I'm hoping nothing I've said here today is really like, oh my God, I can't believe she, she's um, recommending that or, or talking about doing that. Um, you know, it, it truly does make sense from a fiduciary standpoint um, as, you know, a, a steward of investors capital. Um, and so I think, you know, right now it makes sense, but you fast forward five, 10 years, I think your company will be in a very disadvantaged position um, if you didn't get on the front foot and start rolling out those full ESG programs and, and really focusing on, on what you're doing right now. I think, look, it, I, I, I talk a lot, as you can tell, I am like, I can talk about anything. And so I've, I've basically already um, walked through a, a lot of these slides. Um, I will point out quickly and then, Anne, you'll, it'll be over to you for questions, but um, the down here, I, I really like the summary of nickel sources and uses um, just between sulfides and laterites and really how they're used. Um, so again, far and away, um, NPIs and ferro-nickels actually aren't used in batteries. They're used for stainless steel. Um, it's, it's because of that coupling with iron and how hard that is to break and get it to a purity that can go into batteries but it's also because of an emission standpoint. Um, so so a, a bit of differentiation there. And so that is it for my, I guess, formal presentation, but very happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Ashley. I love the depth there. Um, and we've got quite a few questions already in the chat room that are pretty specific to probably some of the slides that cool. you just shared. And then we also have some of our um, students, our graduate students and our undergraduate students um, that are that are joining me as as panelists here that probably have some broader questions that that aren't quite as specific um, as, as uh, your initiative here at Black Metal. So I'm going to just start. They're in the chat box, but I'm going to go ahead and say them. Um, the first one was, "How long will these batteries last before you replace them?" Yep. Um, and then, uh, can batteries using these metals be recycled um, mm -hmm. to help with the supply of the needed materials? And what are the challenges with recycling? I'm going to lump all those into one for you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I drive a Tesla. Um, what I have been told is my battery pack will last about 10 years before needing to be replaced. That's an average. Currently, there's some recycling that happens. So um, I was visiting the Glencore nickel smelter in Sudbury in Canada. Um, and what they do is they effectively deactivate lithium ion batteries throw the battery into the furnace, so into the nickel smelter smelting furnace. Um, some of the nickel and some of the cobalt will come out through that process. The rest is scrapped. Highly inefficient to recycle right now. That being said, probably a month and a half ago, the Wall Street Journal did a really good article um, on some of the startups that are focused on battery recycling. Um, I think if, if y'all are looking for a startup idea, battery recycling is it, uh, but red, Redwood Materials is the one that was specifically profiled. Um, it was started by the Tesla co-founder, so the one that nobody talks about, the non-Elon Musk uh, Tesla guy, but um, really focused on trying to reverse engineer how to recycle these metals out of batteries. Um, so not uh, possible with a high recovery at this stage, but I never bet against human ingenuity. So I, I reckon the code's going to get cracked. Um, great. Okay. Uh, this one's a little broader. Um, I keep skipping around, but basically, uh, 
Can you give a specific example as to how you develop a gas field on a net zero CO2 emission basis? Yes, absolutely. Um, so through a combination of, so there, there are kind of two pieces to it. One is lowering emissions through the production process. So um, maybe you're using electric frat fleets, maybe you're using electric valves, whatever it is. So you're, you need to do both, you need to both lower emissions um, of the operation, but you also need to offset the, the non-removable emissions. So you can do that a few ways. Um, you can buy carbon offsets, just, just buy carbon credits. Um, Australia has a very established system. The US has a very established system. What we're looking at is a bit more intensive. Um, we'll actually be rolling out the plan um, over the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Um, but there are some very sophisticated carbon capture and sequestration technologies. A lot of folks use them as, as EOR techniques, um, but you can also sell it to downstream chemical manufacturers into the hydrogen industry, ammonia, et cetera. Um, so a lot of options there for that captured CO2. Um, great. Is there any growing research on developing synthetic conductors that might replace the need, that might reduce the need for mining? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a huge area of research right now. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed. Well, well, actually, as I, I was about to say, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a research area that's getting more dollars right now. And then I remembered we are in the middle of a global pandemic. So I am certain that COVID-19 is, is getting more research dollars there. So um, I, I took a step back from my statement. But um, certainly, you know, folks are, are doing a lot of research into synthetics and, and how you can engineer out some of these metals. If you look in the future, it is not clear where a lot of these a lot of these materials are going to come from. Um, you know, I, the probably the last 10 years of, of mining um, commodity prices have not been good. So there hasn't been a lot of investment in exploration. And so what that means is now that we're coming up on a phase that folks believe is another kind of mining super cycle, commodity super cycle, um, th there aren't deposits that you can just turn online right now. Um, and so it really is gonna require people to get very creative around historic mines, reprocessing tailings, recycling, and you know, working on, on what else can we use. Um, I'm going to kind of combine these these two questions here. It's talking more on a larger scale and in regard to renewables um, or however you want to phrase it, sustainable energy. Um, now sounds like the the new the new word we're going to be using. Whatever you want to call it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thinking decades and centuries into the future and considering the number of EVs that will be manufactured and the storage needs for wind and solar, can you speak to the challenges of mining? Um, on the other side of that, uh, another question was really just talking about the challenges in regard to the infrastructure um, and the build out of the renewable grid to meet peak demand. Look, I in no way am, am trying to understate the challenge of what's ahead um, and fully agree. It is not clear where a lot of these metals are going to be sourced. Um, you know, uh, we certainly need a lot more investment in exploration and um, inefficient production techniques and in, you know, what is kind of that next generation of material that's going to be deployed into batteries. Um, or, you know, what is that next generation fuel that, that's going to be created um, to, to kind of backfill what we're doing now. Um, and so certainly a lot to be done on the mining, mining exploration side. Um, on, sorry, what, what was the second question? The challenges with the grid of, of, you know, when we're talking about the renewable grid and meeting peak demand, yep. your thoughts on that? So again, another really compelling question. Um, NGP had a SPAC that recently de spac into ChargePoint. Um, I think, I don't know, last, last month or in the, la the last quarter or so. Um, and so ChargePoint is a really big kind of EV charging network. Um, and they've done a good job of kind of getting on the front foot and building that out. 
Um, so certainly a lot of investment to come in, in the, the charging space. Um, I do think, again, the ball is in the court of the folks who already own infrastructure. Um, and so really just trying to adapt your business model such that you capture both segments. So what you don't want is to only be in the segment that, that might be steady state or maybe declining a bit. You also want to diversify your revenue streams and in your core competencies to capture those new and, and growing um, areas. On the renewable grid side, I, I fully agree. Like um, right now, wind and solar cannot be baseload power because, you know, you like when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, it's really hard to bridge that gap, except with huge, huge industrial scale batteries, which we really don't have developed at this stage. There's some vanadium redox battery technologies, but that really hasn't been hashed out. And so again, I go back to natural gas being the answer for both peaking and baseload power. Um, and you will never hear me advocating for, for something else until there's, there's a technology um, evolution. What are your thoughts on nuclear? I have three different questions that are that are in that space. And just because of time, I'm just going to ask you, you know, how do you see that fitting in, uh, you know, in the future? And then another question to follow up with that is where do you think, you know, the Biden administration, um, what kind of role are they going to play? And in, in what, what are you guys at Black Mountain forecasting based off of that? Yeah, um, I actually love nuclear power. Um, I think it's really tough from a public perception standpoint, um, and for that reason, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to take off in in my generation or likely even my kids' generation. Um, don't have kids for the record, so got to have kids first, and then they need to come up in in, <laughs> in adults. But um, you know. I do think from an emission standpoint, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, I think it's tough from the, the NIMBY, like the, the, the NIMBY uh, kind of concept. So not in my backyard. Um, everyone thinks it's a great idea until you got a reactor in your backyard and you're like, I don't know how good of an idea this is. Um, and so I think it's really challenging from that standpoint. What I will say is there are some very compelling startups. Um, there's a fund called Breakthrough Energy Ventures. It's um, Bill Gates kind of, uh, I'm not sure if it's a family office or it's just kind of cornerstoned by him, but it's for like long shot energy investments that they're probably not going to work, but if they work, you're going to like revolutionize the world. Um, and there are some really interesting nuclear fission startups. Um, I reckon if that code gets cracked, that you're kind of getting rid, getting rid of some of the, the NIMBY challenges because um, um, it, it, it is a, a different technique and, and fully done in, in a different manner. But again, I really like nuclear power. It is very clean. There is a challenge around waste, which we're going to have to have people a lot smarter than me thinking about. Um, but I do think there are promising, or rather there is promising research research being done there. And what about what about the new administration? Oh, right. How are you guys uh, adjusting? What are you thinking? Look, um, so we have kind of a good variety of businesses at Black Mountain. So um, there's Black Mountain Metals, which we own nickel and copper mines in Australia. Um, there's Black Mountain Exploration, which we own 1.7 million acres of dry natural gas, again, in Australia. Um, uh, Black Mountain Oil and Gas is is active uh, in the U.S. and um, you know lo looking for opportunities. And then there's Black Mountain Sand. And so you know I wouldn't say we've really changed anything that we're doing um, right now uh, around the kind of administration change. And um, I'd say we have a very balanced and very forward looking portfolio as it is. Um, and so, you know, from an ESG standpoint, I'd say Black Mountain is very strong um, on decreasing emissions, really being focused on what investors are asking for. Um, and it's because, it, you know, it, investors are actively asking us for this every day. And um, it's one of the first questions we'll get when we walk through the door. And so we're trying to be very thoughtful about what we're doing and how we're doing it. 
Thank you, Ashley. There's some more technical questions on the chat that I'm going to move over, just uh, going to skip past, and maybe we'll try to figure out who posted those and we can email them back. Um, but we do have some students that have been a part of putting this together, and I want to reserve the last 15 minutes here um, for them to ask you some, some uh, questions. Um, let's start with Ahmed, just because he, he's the reason you're here today and has started to connect us all. Um, and then uh, I'll let Georgianne ask a question and then, and then Skylar. Cool. Yeah, so I'm kind of liking the audience questions. I don't mind if you can use some of those or we can go ahead and let Georgiana get her thing going. Okay, let's go with Georgiana then. She is one of our Energy MBA students at the Neely School, a second year that is just wrapping up her MBA. Um, Georgiana. Hi, Ashley. Uh, thanks for taking the time to answer our questions today. Um, at first, I was just going to kind of go on a broad perspective of if you're seeing this shift in this energy transition and um, focusing more on natural gas and minerals, do you find that the skill sets from traditional and gas um, transfer well into the, the mining space? How did you kind of make that transition when you started um, metal side of Black Mountain? Yes, no, so that is a very topical question, Georgian. Ann. Um, so as Anne outlined, my background is petroleum engineering. I was a drilling and completions engineer at ExxonMobil before I went and got an MBA. Um, and so my, I'm from a small town in Oklahoma, like my background is fully rooted in the oil and gas business. Um, and so, you know, I do think from a high level, petroleum engineering and oil and gas skill sets are very much comparable to, to the mining side. You're still trying to get something out of the ground. Um, although instead of drilling down to get it and produce it, you're trying to figure out how, how to get a truck down there and, and, and mine it out of the ground. Um, so, you know, a, a bit different, but from, from a high level conceptual standpoint, very similar concepts. Um, also very similar from a financial point of view. Would I ever trust myself to be a mining engineer at this stage? Definitely not. Um, but it is something that I really encourage, you know, um, folks who are studying petroleum engineering. Again, I don't think the oil and gas business is fully going away, but, you know, if they did want to diversify a bit, mining is interesting. But what I really think could be interesting for petroleum engineers is more of this um, carbon capture and carbon storage concept um, because it really is basically reverse reservoir engineering. Instead of trying to produce something out of reservoirs, they're trying to figure out how to put CO2 into reservoirs and hold it there. Um, and I think that's a fantastic skill set for petroleum engineers. And um, so it's something I, I try to advocate for. Thanks, Ashley. Skylar, we have Skylar from Midland. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi there. Um, I, I also work in the oil and gas industry and um, I'm really curious about how specifically you're looking at ESG and how are you maintaining a public image with that? I know that for EOG where I work, we have started a sustainability report that we're gonna do I think quarterly, maybe yearly. Anyways, are y'all incorporating some of those type of public things? Absolutely, we are. Um, so great question, Skylar. Um, there, it's specifically for publicly traded companies, which I'll address that side first. Black Mountain isn't publicly traded, but I'll, I'll address that as well. Um, every kind of broker or, or fund um, now has an, an ESG column. Um, so the, the Bloomberg terminal, for example, can tell you if, if people, if companies check certain ESG boxes or if they don't. Um, and a lot of funds cannot deploy capital into a company that that box is not checked. Um, and so it really benefits a company to try to get on the front foot and be transparent about these issues and what they're doing with these issues. Um, and, and certainly trying to be measurable and have those actionable uh, goals that, that show that you're really trying to um, kind of move the ball down the field. You don't have to be perfect right off the bat. You just have to show what you're doing. And so in that way, I really do think the ball is very much in the oil and gas companies court and um, 
for exactly what you're saying, Skylar. So, you know, EOG is starting to roll out these sustainability reports um, and, and try to be transparent with the market. I think that's the only way and um, trying to kind of hold it back and not say anything. Like you're, you're not doing your investors any favors. And so certainly think, you know, that's that's uh, where things are headed. Um, and it's certainly what we do as well. And um, so when we're raising new capital or just kind of reporting to existing investors, um, it is very much a focus. Um, and, you know, specifically another stakeholder that we're very focused on, although not publicly traded, um, there are, are our customers. And so, you know, really trying to provide that transparency in that traceability to customers. And um, like I was talking about earlier, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on kind of third party verification of this stuff. Um, so, you know, trust, but verify. Um, and so I can certainly see things moving in that direction quite a lot as well. But I do think every company, if you do not have a, a formal ESG program or ESG commitments, you should at least start thinking about it because you, you're you're going to be um, your 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 investors are going to start demanding for you to have one. Great, um, Ashley. Curious, just going back through some of these chat questions to um, one specific. Does Black Mountain have an interest in lithium mining? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> no, no, I, I can, I can't explain why. Uh, that's always like kind of a shocking answer for people, and I can appreciate that. And um, if anybody is familiar with with kind of the um, sand mining business, for example, um, so lithium, uh, I would liken to to kind of kind of that business, and so. There is a lot of lithium in the world, um, a lot. Inherently, it is the world's most prevalent element in, in, in its crust. Um, and so in Australia, they, they're mining kind of hard rock lithium. Um, down in South America, mining lithium brines, um, bit of a variety, but effectively, probably let's call it three years ago, a ton of capital was like, lithium ion batteries, I better go get some lithium and build a lithium mine and we are doing this um, and basically flooded the market with lithium. Um, now we're going through the, the, what we're seeing is a lot of the lithium players are starting to go under and there's a lot of consolidation in the space. And um, that being said, if lithium price rises, there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of already built out lithium capacity that can immediately come online. Um, so it's not a market that we want to get involved in right now. I'd say in 10 years, it becomes very, very compelling. And those folks that stuck it out and did the hard yards through this decade um, will hopefully be able to get returns there. But kind of the way we're thinking about it is maybe the third or fourth owner of, of lithium mines will start making money. Unpopular. Okay. Great. Um, Alan Burnett, one of our alums at Neely um, from Houston. When will we reach peak battery creation? And uh, referring to it in a, a parallel with, with oil, what would you, if you had to guess? Oh my gosh. So look, I won't even try to guess that one. It takes someone a lot smarter than me who has better forecasting tools and abilities. And um, that being said, I genuinely, like one of my core principles is never bet against human ingenuity. Um, and I think there's just so much to be done around battery recycling and really getting creative with what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, that I think anybody who would tell you an answer, they're gonna be wrong anyway, because technology continuously evolves as it should. You know, humans were not created to just continue steady state, just doing the same old thing it's day in and day out. Um, so I, for one, am certainly looking forward to seeing what technology comes out. Um, our panelists, any other questions, Georgianne, Skylar, Ahmed, that you want to you want to hear Ashley's thoughts on before we wrap it up? Sure. Like, um, who do you find to be your competition? Like, how do you measure your success? Oh, um, oh man. Um, no. So look, it just, it depends which business it, it's on. Um, and so, 
you know, on, on, the, on the nickel side, so uh, Black Mountain Metals, um, we'd very much be measuring ourselves against, you know, like the kind of comps within Australia. Um, so the biggest nickel miner in Australia is BHP. Um, so, you know, look at kind of what they're doing and see how you're measuring up against them. Um, there are a ton of nickel miners in Australia because it's one of the largest nickel producing countries in the world. Um, and so from that standpoint, certainly like to try to benchmark uh, geographically similar uh, companies and then also choose best in class regardless of where it is in the world and measure yourself on profitability and ESG standards. Again, no one is in business to lose money, so you can't lose sight of that, um, but just ESG is now a part of that for sure. Um, and, and the same answer would go on, on kind of the oil and gas side. Um, certainly always aim to be a thought leader and see these trends coming and trying to get out in front of them and create real value. Um, and so, you know, there's not always a, a great comp to fully measure the entire business against, but you can always find a, a parallel, um, a, a, a parallel segment with, within kind of the, the broader scale of companies. Anything else from our panelists? Quick one question. Oh, go ahead, Georgian. Sorry. One thing I will say quickly that I didn't touch on in the presentation, but um, is something that I inevitably get asked a lot. Um, and I just want to plug it right here and right now. Um, it's around uh, domestic energy security and the fact that a lot of these metals aren't currently being mined in the US. When we were setting up Black Mountain Metals, obviously like we're in Texas, you know, we, we said, okay, what can we buy in the U S um, not a tremendous amount of, of specifically this type of mining activity. Um, there's some exploration stuff, but effectively caught up in permitting and it will take legitimately between 10 and 15 years before there's an actual mine there. And so we weren't able to, to make these investments in the U S so had to look to either Canada or Australia to, find these kinds of resources. So this is like a call to action for folks in the resources space. We really need to get on the front foot and ensure that um, the US is participating in this next mining super cycle because there's a tremendous amount of value to be created and a bunch of money to be made. Um, and I'd love to see that, uh, some of that being made here in the US. Um, so if you're in resources, start kind of putting your mind to that and, and talking to whoever will listen. Thanks, Ashley. That was actually the question I was about to tee up was where you were, if you were thinking of going to a ge different geographic market or even a different um, expanding outside of the current nickel space that you were in. Um, mm -hmm. if, in like if you were choosing to invest next or someone else choosing to get into this space, where would that be? You know, um, I'm a believer that resources are complicated enough investments and projects to pull off that you should try to um, isolate as many variables as possible. So our personal kind of investment philosophy is tier one jurisdictions only, um, such that you don't have to worry about that geopolitical variable entering in um, to, to your overall investment thesis and investment capacity. Um, people have different approaches there, but you know, for, for us, it, it's really a kind of tier one jurisdictions, strong rule of law, good history of mining and oil and gas in the country, and um, not just kind of the lone ranger maverick out there doing it by yourself. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you for your time. Uh, we want to honor our stop here at, at five o'clock so everyone can, can move on with their day, but um, very enlightening, very interesting. Um, I think it's also reflective, a, a, a short, small plug for the, the, the Neely programs and the, um, the uh, programs that the Institute, Energy Institute offer in that um, we are, our conversation is changing. We were not talking about this much at all this time last year. Um, and we have, I think over 25 faculty members amongst different colleges um, at TCU that are, that are teaching in the energy space in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and everybody's content is changing and our conversations in the classrooms are changing. 
Um, and, you know, it's, it's a great time, I think, for anyone that is thinking about um, going back to school and pursuing your education, either with a certificate or with an MBA or with a minor, if we have some undergrads on here. Um, um, there is a lot to learn and to lean into the expertise of the faculty as we navigate this transition um, is huge. And so um, we would love to, to continue that conversation with anyone. Um, and you can always sit in on our classes via Zoom now. That's the nice thing about our new world. Um, and our Energy MBA is offered 100% live remotely. So you can partake in that whatever city um, you call home and uh, get to be a horn frog. Um, Ashley, we're thrilled to get to continue this relationship and tap into your expertise. Um, what a blessing. And again, thank you so, so much. And thank you to the Institute, to Richard, um, and to the Ken Davis Lecture Series, who continues to, to bring compelling thought leaders like you um, on campus to, to make sure we're talking about the things that count and the things that matter. I certainly appreciate it. And it was a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you all tuning in. Um, and please reach out if I can ever be helpful. All right, I'm gonna leave. So long, everybody.